All right. Uh, welcome to another edition of uh, Level Up Podcast. And we're here with uh, Josh and Mara. And we're going to have a conversation uh, about this week's uh, scripture and this week's sermon and, uh, and what Mara was, is going to be teaching the kids online. And so uh, just curious, how did everybody celebrate Easter? Anything different? Uh, the, the biggest difference for me was that I got to be at home uh, Easter morning when my kids got their Easter basket. <laughs> Typical Sunday morning is, you know, we're all at the church super early. And so Chelsea's at home with the kids. And so I got to be home when the kids found their Easter baskets this year. So that was pretty That's cool. Awesome. Yeah. Right. yeah. I, was, I feel like this um, year I decided, well, we're going to make the most of this situation and it's going to be the Easter week of fun. Uh, we started the week. My kids made a list of all of their hopes and dreams for things that they wanted to do. And we just actually had the time to, to check them off one by one. And we had bunny rabbit cupcakes and an Easter egg hunt. And we got through all of our resurrection eggs. Like we just had a, we, had more time to do the things that I know that they'll remember more. That's awesome. That's awesome. We didn't get to go to a chocolate fountain, so I, I missed that. And, uh, <laughs> so, that I heard that have... you made a good, uh, a pretty good meal though. That's what I heard from your son. Yeah, so. yeah we smoked some pork and, uh, and it was pretty good. It's pretty good. And had Ines over and sanitized her side of the table, made her stay 10 feet from us because we didn't want her to spend this Easter alone, but uh, we had a good time just, Different. We enjoyed our first live stream service, which was a new experience for us all, and and uh, got to see people in the parking lot. That's the first time I've trusted people to be in a parking lot and not get run over. And so it was, it was a good it was a good time. We had a good time. Those of you who came out, we do appreciate you coming out, and we yes. enjoyed seeing you. Uh, but let's get let's get into the passage. Uh, get Mara, would you give us some background on the passage? Right. So um, t- technically, we're really picking up today where we left off last week. Um, This is the same day as the resurrection. So um, three days prior to this, Jesus had been crucified. They had seen his his dead body. They had done some of the burial preparations um, with the intention to come back after the Sabbath and finish those. Um, And instead of being able to finish his burial preparations, they were greeted and um, had the news that he was alive and that they um, had seen him in his resurrected is... uh, resurrected body form. So this is um, where we're going to pick up here in John is the same day, just later in the evening. Josh, why don't you go ahead and read John 19 through 29. Yeah. So John chapter 20, uh, 19 through 29. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. And when he had said this, He showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Such a uh, such a fascinating passage. Um, I have, <clears throat> we you know we we, we typically do. What, what do we see? What do we notice? I mean, I have, as, as I'm preparing for this, I have so many things uh, that I'm just like, I just want to spew this out, but I, I'm going to try not to, to just preach a message here. So I'm going to first defer to you guys. What are you, uh, what are you noticing here? What stands out to you? Well, I think that the, what stands out in this passage to, to me is the doubt that's in the middle of it, of, 
with one of the 12. I mean, I think uh, there's, I don't know if it's intentional or not, but although there's 11 that believe and, and see, there's one that doesn't and doesn't believe. And so that, that of course stands out that this is a part of the story. So we get doubting Thomas and uh, get this little moniker for this guy. Yeah, I kind of, um, I, when I was reading this, I had to break it out and I'm like, this is just a rush of information, but this is happening starting Easter night. And then there's some information about what's kind of happening in that week after. And then like it kind of culminates in that eight days later. Um, and so we see like that Thomas wasn't with them when Jesus first appeared. He kind of missed out on that. But then by the time that Jesus shows up eight days later, like Thomas is, is back with the disciples. So I was kind of interested in that he, he made in that week in between, he's made this statement that unless I see it, I, I won't believe, I'm, I, I can't believe that. But yeah, he still is, um, he's with his community. He's with his group, even in the midst of um, feeling maybe left out that they've all seen this and he hasn't and wrestling with that. Yeah, it's good. Why, so just jump, jump in there. Why do, you, why do you think Thomas wasn't in the room with them that day, that night, whatever? I don't know. I Actually, I was kind of looking into more of Thomas and doing some research because, I yeah, I'm like, I love doing this because I feel like it gives me that chance to just really dig deep and like, okay, what are, what are other people saying? What, what has um, been said about this before? And um, one thing I was reading was, was talking about Thomas mentioning like specifically seeing the where the nails were and like this thing inside and that this is really the first time that even like the use of nails is really mentioned like it doesn't really appear in any of the accounts of the crucifixion and so they're saying so that could be evidence that he was one of like the eyewitnesses there and was so traumatized by that experience that he kind of removed himself from the group maybe was processing his grief individually um but they were saying that he um seems to speak of, of something that he himself witnessed and was very impacted by mm -hmm. yeah i think i think that i don't think it'd be a, a, an unlikely thing for somebody to just kind of go well i'm going home <laughs> and and if you think about this if, if the crucifixion was on a friday and and Th thomas was from galilee uh, you know these guys had to have stayed in jerusalem uh, Galilee was, I believe, 60 plus miles away on foot. That's going to take you a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I could very well see that, that Thomas said, I'm just heading home. I, I'm not staying around here. I'm going home. And so on that first day of the week, he may have been on the road back towards his house and then heard of the resurrection uh, as he is on his way and, and returned. I, I don't know. Uh, but I agree with you, Mara. That would be something that would it would make you want to run for the hills uh, if right. nothing else. Yeah, it even says that they were um, hiding for fear of the Jews, like the Romans, like that is not mentioned in this, like their own people. Here Jesus had, the things that he had taught, things that he had said had incited so much anger, even in their their family, their friends, their, their community, that they were, um, yeah, they were probably feeling like targets after right. Jesus' death. Yeah, yeah. yeah there, there had to be fear that, a similar fate was coming for them, right? I mean, they, they were known as Jesus's followers. Um, and so, man, I just, yeah, the grief and the, uh, the fear and just everything that he had devoted his life to for the past three years was just, was gone. And so I think it's pretty natural to just kind of, well, there's three years of my life I'm not going to get back and just kind of go back to, to normal. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's, I think, um, let me, let me ask this. So Paul, you, you talked about the kind of moniker, the, the nickname doubting Thomas. Um, and I, I, in previous conversations, you said, oh man, I wonder if the disciples called him that if they, yeah. if they know, knew him as doubting Thomas, but regardless, um, in today, uh, when we talk about this, we, we kind of, uh, we use that terminology as, uh, almost a negative kind of a, uh, a slight to, to Thomas. Um, I don't know, maybe just thoughts on that. Like was, is this, do, does he get too bad of a rap? Uh, should we, should he not get as bad of a rap as we make him uh, make it out to be? What do you think? I wonder if any of the disciples would have said the same thing if they would have been absent. I, I mean, I, I think Thomas just happened to be absent, uh, but, but I'm not convinced. I mean, let, let's face it. When um, the ladies came back to the disciples 
and told them that he is resurrected, what did they do? They ran to the tomb. Right. <laughs> so they didn't believe the ladies that he was, had, or, or they wouldn't have ran to a tomb. And so, you know, I, I think it, besides the fact, what's it even mean? <laughs> you know, what's it mean to them? I mean, so all these questions, we, we have the hindsight of um, the, the whole New Testament manuscript plus 2,000 years of the church interpreting for us what this means. Uh, they have none of that. Uh, they, they have the remembrance of Jesus' words. Uh, they have the Old Testament text. Uh, they have a, a body that's gone. And so, um, yeah, I think they'd be full of doubt and questions. And, and, you know, but for Thomas being gone or but for Peter being there, Peter could have been doubting Peter as well or Peter, doubting John or whatever, whichever disciple you want to fill in there. Yeah. I, it's so like, at, the, at the beginning of this passage, what Jesus essentially did for the disciples that were there in the room is exactly what, um, what Thomas was asking for, essentially. Now, Thomas was more, you know, touching and feeling, but Jesus showed up and showed him his hands and his side. And so it's like, listen, if, if they wouldn't have seen that, they would have doubted that as well. Um, they just happened to be there. Uh, and Thomas wasn't. So, so it's just this bad rap for, for Thomas, uh, for, for doubting Thomas has, has always bothered me because it's like, man, the, the disciples got ex needed exactly what Thomas needed in order to believe. They just happened to be there when Jesus showed up. Right. And as you kind of read, even in some of the other gospel accounts about this time, right after his um, resurrection, there's even a lot of times where they'll say they saw them and yet they still were questioning. They still were doubting. They still were afraid. And so even some of the people that had had that experience, um, I don't know that it was just smooth sailing and that they were, had a, a clear view of what was happening next. Yeah. So when, whenever they would, Peter would call Thomas doubting Thomas, Thomas would say, well, you're just going and going fishing, Peter, even though he's told you to stay here. Uh, so they'd all have their monikers after their worst moments. Yeah. Sure. If I remember right, I think that you were the one that denied even knowing him. Yeah. Denier. <laughs> Back off me, Peter. <laughs> yeah. Um, this, I, this, this idea of Thomas not being um, with, the, with the disciples and kind of what happens next and this idea of connections and community, I think is, is pretty fascinating. Uh, and as I think through this, I think, uh, again, Thomas maybe gets a bad rap, um, and, and I don't think he deservedly so, uh, but perhaps the one, um, the one, I don't know if you want to say mistake or the thing that he was missing is just that he, had, he was going through this time of grief and fear and shock and uncertainty alone uh, for whatever reason scripture doesn't really say why he wasn't there um but whatever he was going through he was going through alone and i think that that was maybe uh uh maybe tough and that, that um, contributed to some things maybe um but i think so where i want to go with this is um thomas wasn't there uh the disciples were and then how did thomas find out about this uh, other other versions make it a little bit more sound a little uh, different where the disciples actually went and found Thomas. It seems as though they went and found Thomas to tell him this. So it was almost like this, this great uh, revelation for them and this like, you will never guess what we saw. And so then they go and find Thomas. And then the next thing that we see, and that's when Thomas says, uh, you know, unless I touch the, the, uh, the scars or the wounds, put my hand aside, then I'm not going to believe it. And then eight days later, uh, Jesus is showing up again. And who's there? Thomas is there. So I guess my, my point of discussion there is what is the, what is the role of community um, when it comes to doubt and, uh, and processing those things? Yeah, I think this is an interest, and I think this is the conversation uh, when we talk about this on Sunday that we'll have to spend some time with. What is the role of community? Community can either uh, can isolate you in your doubts or it can um, embrace you in your doubts. And, you know, I know of people that in the midst of their doubts, community did not do a good job of embracing them in doubt and it, in essence, cast them out. 
And, and so, yeah, I, what, what I see in this, Josh, is even in their doubts, even in his doubt, they still embrace him. Uh, you know, they don't say, get out of here, Thomas. If you're not going to be on board with us and listen to us, we just want you, you, you know, we want this group to be pure believers, and you're not. Uh, but instead, they just, uh, they just allow him to be a part. And so I, I think there's a two-pronged thing there. There's, there's two approaches. Number one, um, when, when we have doubt, the temptation is to leave community, and we, it's when we really need to be in community. And when people have doubts in community, community has to embrace them, not isolate them. Yeah, I was just thinking, um, I can almost picture him sitting there with them just saying, okay, tell me, like, tell me this again, like, walk me through this one more time. Like, you saw him where, you saw him do what, like, I, I don't know, for me, I could just picture that he is just probably, like, wanting to hear this story, wanting to hear their stories, wanting to... Um, I mean, I don't know. I kind of feel like the fact that he's there maybe is almost him being cautiously um, optimistic, like that, that maybe, maybe it'll happen again. So um, I see him as wanting to say, okay, well, this has happened for them. I, I want that for myself. So I, I, I don't want to miss it this time. Um, but I also think the disciples then had a, a great chance there to, instead of ridiculing him, instead of saying, well, what do you mean you can't believe this? What do you mean you can't, you can't understand that this is true? I feel like they really did. They embraced him, allowed him um, and encouraged him to stay in their community and allowed him to, um, yeah, continue to not be sure what, what to believe, what, um, what to think of any of it, but that he was still part of their, like part of their crew. And they, they pursued him. uh, Yeah. I think it's fascinating. I I would imagine that um, Thomas not being there on that first day had, very little to do with uh, any sort of being outcast by the group. Uh, it was his own thoughts and his feelings, and the, maybe even the way that he would be perceived and, and things like that. Um, but then we see the disciples pursuing him to kind of bring him back into the fold, even after he said, no, I'm not going to believe this. unless okay. I." See, which the disciples didn't know if, uh, if Jesus would show up again in the same way, right? They had no idea that Jesus was going to do that. We get the advantage of seeing it from this viewpoint, this side of history. Um, so they had no idea if Jesus was going to show up to give Thomas what he needed. Um, and they still kind of uh, invite him back into the fold and, and part of the community. And he's there even in the midst of of that doubt, which speaks uh volumes to kind of our role as as the church and as a community um to well, first of all to be a place where doubts can be expressed and questions can be asked and mm-hmm. um i i talk with you know just in terms of teens like um questions are going to arise and they're going to be discussed and i would much rather we have those discussions at church than somewhere else right um, because we can kind of we can help process that. So. Well, I mean, it's, it's your, it's your vision of church, e- either church is a community of the perfected or it's the community that perfects. And, and I think there's a vast difference between the two. If it's the community that perfects, we invite people in with their doubts, with their misgivings, with their, wherever they are so they can experience the grace. And, and, you know, I believe the church is a means of grace. And, and, and when we isolate or exclude people that, that maybe don't seize on to our, our um, our doctrine, <laughs> our our polity, or you know whatever word you want to use, then then we're missing the point of what the church is here to do. Yeah, I was also just kind of thinking. I think sometimes it's easy to look at the disciples, and um, not to dehumanize them, but take away some of the um, the relational aspects that were going on there. Here, these are twelve guys that had spent the better part of three years together, and we we know we see in the Bible that some of their squabbles, some of their disagreements, some of their this, and um, when we think they've traumatically just lost Judas. I mean, one of their one of their twelve, um, they've watched him betray Jesus. They've watched that, and then part of me goes, I don't. I mean, I don't think that Judas didn't have any friends. What if Thomas was like Judas's friend in that group? And like that there was that fear that that, that that had just happened. And so he could be associated with that. And maybe that's why he had isolated himself. 
or that there was, um, I mean, maybe he's mourning both the loss of Jesus and the loss of Judas and that he is kind of dealing with his own things that may have been different than even what the other disciples were experiencing. I don't know. That's just me kind of putting into like how these human relationships would have been woven together. They, none of them were in isolation. They were all in very tight knit community. And, and as you mentioned, just Judas, it, it never really dawned on me. Judas was the keeper of the money. They lost all their resources. So when Judas left, he didn't leave behind the bank account. He took the money and left. And uh, so they, they've lost their leader. They've lost their financing. And now they're starting to gradually lose other followers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is a repetitive question, but what, so on a practical level, what do you think that that looks like for us as the church uh, to be a place where, where, where we can embrace doubt, questions, be a place where we can process through that? Or, or maybe that's to say, where do you think is the best place for that to take place within the church? The deeper the relationship, the easier that happens. The, the richer, the more trusting the relationship is. I mean, to, to share your doubts, you've got to trust the person you're sharing, sharing your doubts with. And not only that, the, the person has to um, respond to doubt in a, in a way that's worthy of trust. And so I, I think in the smaller group, I mean, I don't think you stand in that community and everybody expresses their doubts and their sins. But I think it's in the smaller that that occurs. And so if the call smaller is not helping, happening, then this doesn't occur. I mean, if, if you're not making connections and, you know, we're, we're speaking to our church here. I mean, it's just a conversation between us, but this is this, you know going out to our church theoretically, and maybe you're listening to this and, and you're not plugged in. It, it's, it's very difficult to be part of a church unless you make yourself vulnerable and become part of the church. And, and that's small groups, that's friendships. And if, if you're having trouble making those connections, see one of us and we will definitely find a place that you can plug in. Cause, cause that's the goal. If, if you don't plug into the body, if you really don't plug in and make those connections, it's going to be very difficult to move through, through significant doubt. I think that that vulnerable word, that, that authenticity, I think, uh, it starts there. I think, um, I think we can foster uh, a culture of being okay with that by being willing to talk about things, questions, doubts, tensions that we have um, to not pretend that everything is good and that we never experience these things. Um, because if, uh, if, if someone never hears anyone uh, who they see as a leader in, in, their, in the faith, uh, talk about these things or, or address these things. Then when they start feeling those, it's, it's kind of a, well, you know, I never see anybody else wrestling with this. And so right. this must be out of character and bad. And so I then have to suppress it. So I think that that authenticity and that vulnerability um, from the top down really is just, is, is huge. Yeah. And I think about vulnerability kind of in real time as well, because I think sometimes it's tempting to hold on to those, um, those tensions, those doubts, those questions, those concerns. And then um, you want to kind of do the big reveal at the end and say, oh, man, I really wrestled with that. But but I'm, I'm, I'm over that now and I'm, I'm ready to move forward. And I think sometimes being able to yeah wrestle with that in, in real time, live with people um, being open about, hey, I read this. It just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to me. I'm not understanding how this all fits together. I, I, I trust, like my faith has, has led me to know that I, I should continue to trust, but I don't, I don't understand what I'm seeing right now. And I think, especially like you said, um, seeing that from, from leadership, seeing that is the culture of our church to say, hey, we, no one is going to be able to build their faith in isolation. We build it in community and we don't expect you to come with all the answers that you have figured out. Um, to share with us, but we want to we want to wrestle and ask those questions together and and seek the answers that that are, we can find and also um, appreciate the tension and um, wrestle through the ones that we don't have answers to yet. I love that vulnerability in real time. That that is an awesome. That's an awesome thought because you're right. Most of the time we come with after we've resolved it. Oh, now I'm all good and. 
that does that's not the same level of powerful when you come with hey here's where i am i need you to pray with me and walk with me yeah. as i try to sort this out that's awesome yeah yeah that is that, that's good um so I, I think that that maybe uh le lends us well to to the next uh question next point of discussion here is uh personally um walking through through doubts tensions questions uh who who in your life has kind of helped you to move past those or maybe not even moving past maybe um may may not be a, a as good a way to put it but working through uh in the midst of uh that has led you to a deeper faith who do you have in your life that that has kind of helped you in that i'd say terry probably more than anybody in my life be you know we, we've now we've now been together longer than we've been apart. And so, you know, there's nobody closer to me than Terry. And, you know, I can have real conversations about what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling. And, uh, you know, she, she's always there and always supportive. So I, I can't think of anybody more supportive that, than her when I think about walking through doubts. Because if anybody never wonders, your pastor has doubts every once in a while. He has to work through them. I mean, I, I am just like you. I have things I have to work through. And God's still, I'm still a work in pro progress. And God's still working on me. And sometimes I have questions. Yeah, man, you stole my answer. I was, I was going to say, I was going to say Ryan. Say it really, it's really a oh, bonus. When, well, Terry. not Terry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it really has been, yeah, such a gift to be married to the kind of person that, I mean, like, yeah, I, you, I trust him with my deepest fears. I mean, he's the person that you can, like, the lights are all out. It's dark. And you just, like, say the thing out loud that you're like, all right, I'm just going to say this so that you know that this is what I'm thinking right now. Um, I don't expect you to have an answer, but I need you to know that this is this is why the tears are coming today. Like this is, this is where I'm at right now. So, um, but I mean, I also have, I have been blessed with some really great friends though, that I also can really trust to speak truth into my life and to just encourage me. Um, even when they don't have the answers, they just kind of keep pointing me, um, to keep on pressing in. You know, I, I think that's a good thing to, to kind of focus on real friends don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. If somebody has all the answers, I, I don't know if I want to, <laughs> I don't know if I want to spend too much time talking to them because the truth is some of the questions we ask, there's not easy answers to. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I, uh, so I'm probably, so <laughs> being vulnerable, being authentic, authentic, <laughs> being authentic. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, I probably have, uh, worked through this in a way that is probably going against what we said. And, and, and now I see that that was probably not the best way to do it, but in my time of <clears throat> significant doubt and working through things, um, I kind of had the, uh, the mindset of I am a pastor and I probably it's tough for me to find places within the church to, uh, to talk through these. And so to be completely honest, I found that, community in that that place those, those people to walk through that with me uh probably more in an online virtual and um uh books and podcasts and uh facebook pages um of of people who were, were thinking through things the way that i was uh and and that helped me in in that time um but now looking back i also see that probably those maybe those fears of uh, rejection and fears of not being accepted uh, and my doubts not being welcome was probably more in my head than reality. Uh, um, and so, but that's what I did. Um, moving past that, uh, there have been significant uh, friendships and relationships uh, where, where I have been able to kind of talk through those. And I'm deeply appreciative of those. Um, but, but, but again, it was, it was kind of out of a place of fear that I, uh, that I worked through those in, in other places. <laughs> and, uh, and so I guess my, my desire now is I want to do everything that I can to create a culture where someone else doesn't have to feel like I felt. And again, that's not, I didn't, I don't think that I felt the way that I felt because of anyone else but me and just in my own head. Um, and so I want to create a culture 
where no one else has to feel uh, to feel that way. Um, so that's yeah, yeah. it's good. <clears throat> um, yeah. I, so uh, I, the, the next question here is kind of um, maybe beyond just people, but what do what are some maybe practical ways to uh, to kind of move through doubts now? Um, things that have worked for you. Um, yeah, maybe just some pointers there. What works for you? <laughs> I'm, I'm a big believer in that it's not about answers. It's about presence that, that ultimately, um, you know, cause I, you know, when you, when you start talking about why is there evil in the world and why is there suffering in the world, I, I've never resolved those questions. It's easy to say, well, you know, it's because of sin and sin's because of free will, but you start spiraling down that rabbit hole uh, you know, there's a never ending discussion there. And so in a lot of these situations, I had to resolve my doubt, not with an answer to a question, but an assurance of God's love. Uh, that, that, you know, oftentimes my doubts, uh, when, when it comes down to it, it gets to Jesus. <laughs> and I see Jesus, and it's, that's my only answer, uh, you know. And so I'll die with my best answer is Jesus. And uh, that, that, that may not be satisfactory to some people. Maybe they want to sort things out, have everything lined up. I don't, I, I, everything's not lined up, but Jesus, Jesus is just all right by me. I, I, that's, <laughs> I'm not going to start saying it, <laughs> but, but I come back to Jesus. Really that song into this podcast. Oh, pretty good. That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> No, I think about that too. I mean, oftentimes I come back to the story where Jesus, I think it was right after he fed the 5,000 and um, he was kind of teaching and like a lot of people abandoned him. And he's like, is this, this teaching is hard. Like, I understand it's hard for you. Are, and he even asked some of his disciples, are, are you? Um, and they just said like, like, where else would we go? Like you have the words of life. Like we, <laughs> we don't understand this, but like, we know that like, this is, um, this is the choice that we're making. Um, and oftentimes I think about how, I mean, God has given us this beautiful gift of, of a mind that wants to learn, that wants to understand, that wants to grow. And, um, sometimes we think we're like, Oh, well, God has given us this mind and we want to, to, um, ask all these questions. We want to do, dig into all of these things. And, um, I think that there's a point where we can kind of go and come like full circle around there where all of a sudden we begin to really rely on our mind over God. And we start to say, well, if he gave me this mind and I should be able to understand this. And we start to separate though, like the, um, the, the, it's a gift in the first place. Like I think back of the verse of um, like his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And like, that's always been something that's been really comforting to me when I get to the end of what I can make sense of, what I can think through. I um, oftentimes, and it is, it's just kind of a release of a, okay, I have thought this through to the best of my ability and I still am coming up with, I really hope and trust that, that God has this because I, I don't. And um, so that has always been a, a comfort to me. Um, but I, I know that maybe for some people that, that isn't, that, um, <laughs> that doesn't sit well. I'm, I'm probably one of those where I'm like, the, the idea of, you know, God's ways are, are not my ways. Uh, and I, <laughs> that's just, that to me, that's like, well, well that's ridiculous. Like we got to figure this out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and so <laughs> um, I, I think the idea though of moving through doubts maybe, uh, maybe tends to suggest that we have moved through doubts mm -hmm. and that we've come out on the other side. Mm -hmm. I would suggest, and I don't know if this is right or not, but if you don't have doubts, that means that you have everything figured out. Mm -hmm. And if you have everything figured out, then there's no place for faith. Mm -hmm. um, so if, where's faith if there's no doubt? You know what I mean? If you, if you have everything figured out. So I think this idea of moving through those things and solving them, mm -hmm. that's, there's, that's not faith at all. That's, I've got it all figured out. And so I'm going to follow this. Um, so, uh, so, but I think there are things that we can, we can do to, to kind of walk in those doubts and to, uh, to, to be sustained in the midst of those doubts. And I think of, I think of Thomas here, um, he needed what he needed in order to sustain him in his doubts was, uh, an encounter with Christ. 
uh, an encounter with the risen Christ. Uh, he needed to see and to touch and to feel, and he needed that encounter. What's interesting is throughout the book of John, there are, there are other places where people didn't believe until they had their own encounter with Christ. Uh, I think, um, uh, I think it was uh, Philip and Nathaniel when Jesus was calling them. Uh, Philip was on board and, uh, and then tells Nathaniel and Nathaniel's like, well, can anything good come from Nazareth? But then he encounters Jesus himself and he follows the woman at the well. She encounters Christ and then goes back to her town and tells people, it says that some believed, but then Jesus went there, and they and more people encountered Christ, and so then more believed, uh, and so it's just this idea of, of an encounter with Christ. And so for me personally, um, the, getting through doubts uh, isn't about solving everything and figuring everything out and getting rid of the tensions, um, but I think it is uh, um, kind of a, a remembering of my own personal encounters with Christ. Um, mm -hmm maybe looking ahead to a new encounter with Christ, but in the meantime, remembering those encounters with Christ that I have had that sustain me uh, to, to uh, sustain me even in my doubt, not that I have to figure them out, um, but awesome. in the midst of them, Christ sustains his grace sustains us. That's good. Yeah. I love that. I'm, um, I, I, I'm a journaler. I wish I would, could say I'm a consistent journaler. I feel like I journal more in seasons where I am, I'm, I'm walking through um, some questions. I'm walking through some hard, um, hard times in my faith. And it has always been um, so good for me to be able to look back through those and to see the emotions, the frustrations, see, and some of them have, I mean, they've yet to be resolved. I'm not telling you that, Oh, I look back through my journals and now I can see exactly how and why all of those things have woven together. Um, but I do feel like sometimes keeping those records of here's where I'm at today. Here's what I'm feeling. Here's what I'm thinking. I even, um, my Bible has a, a wide margin in the side and there's lots of times when I'll read and I'll just put the date next to something that I've read that's, um, that has really spoken to me. And then it's like, I can go back through the years and reread that again and be in a totally different place. Um, but again, see that, that living, um, that living word that has affected me and, and impacted me in a new way. Um, I also want, I love music. I feel like there's certain songs that I hear them and they immediately take me back to certain seasons, probably because I played them on repeat and I'm like, I don't have much to hang on to right now, but I've got this song that is speaking life into me right now. And so those are some things as I'm thinking back, man, what has, what has helped me the most, what has sustained me the most through, um, through those times and awesome. things like that. Well, what do you think, Josh? We're getting pretty close to an end here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to, yeah. So maybe let's talk practical application. Um, so uh, teens, uh, parents of teens, maybe watching this, um, take away practical application. Uh, there are there's lots of studies out there about uh, teens walking away from their faith after graduating high school. Uh, Sticky Faith is an organization that has done significant research on that, and uh, and one of the one of the big contributing factors that they've found is unexpressed doubt uh, has led to teens walking away from their faith. And so, man, I would just encourage you as a family, um, we talk about, you know, the church being a place that is welcoming of doubt and questions. Um, but I would challenge you as a family, what does it look like for your family to be that welcoming place, that community where questions, hard questions can be uh, talked about, asked, um, and, and walk through those. And I would just say, if you, uh, you know, if you are looking for resources or help uh, in, in, in dealing with that and, and walking through those, please reach out to me. I would love to, uh, to resource you in that. Uh, Mara, what about, what about kids and families with kids? I feel like when we talk about kids here at our church, we're talking about birth all the way up through sixth grade. And I mean, you guys know that those kids are changing from this big to adult size. And in the middle of that, they are changing so much um, mentally, internally, in terms of how they understand themselves, they understand their place in our faith community. And so I think um, one of the best suggestions I could give um, for each of our parents is to um, is to look into understand a little bit more about your kid at their specific age, and I would love to help you with this. I have got tons of resources for different phases of development, and really some great ways to um, to 
discuss faith um, while also nurturing them as they d- develop it for themselves. Because what we are not doing is we are not handing our faith to our kids. We want to be along and walking alongside them as they develop a personal, authentic faith. And we talk about faith is so valuable in our community. We want our kids to see their place in that, but also to hold their faith and that it's going to be authentic and it's transformative in their lives. So for our babies, sometimes, I mean, that just looks like telling them that God made them. We don't need to, they don't need to understand all of it. We don't understand all of it, but just if they know some truths, God made them, God loves them. And Jesus, he came, he wants to be their friend. And then we work all the way up to middle school where we are starting to help them wrestle with what does that look like? to live that authentically? How does it look like in my relationships with my family, with my friends? So I would love to match you up with some age specific resources that um, I think could really, really help you to understand a little bit about where your kid is at, because we don't want to dumb down our faith. We don't want to make it childish. We want it to fit them where they are, but we also don't want to overreach and, um, maybe in a well-meaning, a well-intentioned way, think that we can prevent our kids from having doubts and questions if we just try to answer them all right away. If we just try to um, give them all of our doubts and all of our questions without letting them discover and move into those themselves. Um, I worry kind of going too far that other way can really lead to some skepticism in our kids and almost this inherent distrust. Like that that somehow that God needs to earn their trust. He, it, he doesn't make any sense. So, um, but we want them to discover it. We want them to be amazed. We want them to discover and move towards him um, in that versus trying to just keep passing it down to them. Mm-hmm. So, um, I mean, I just encourage all parents to share. I mean, as appropriate, the times when we just look outside right now, this doesn't make sense. I don't understand why this is happening. And it's okay for our kids to hear us say, I don't know. It's hard for people. It's hard for me. I like to know. Give me Google. I will find all the answers. But I think it's important for our kids to hear us say, I don't know. Let's look at it together. Let's see. But I don't know. Yeah, that's good. That's good. It's been a great discussion. And I, I think we could probably go another hour talking about this. And, <laughs> and it, would, it, would be, it would be fun, but maybe not fun for those having to listen to two hours of us talking about doubt, but, but it's a significant, a significant conversation uh, because I believe there, there's people that have doubt that don't know how to handle it. I, I appreciate, or I, I really believe that one of the, the things the church does is the church leads its kids and leads its, uh, you know, our, our most fertile uh, missionary field is our kids, and we have an obligation to them uh, to help them and, and move them deeper into their faith. As I think about this, when, when we're talking about um, doubt and faith, you know, the object of, of what we're doing is not that we know, but that we believe and have faith. And, and the response to doubt is greater faith. And so you may not get all the answers, but even in the midst of doubt, we can have, uh, we can have greater faith if, if we allow and we trust God in those circumstances. So I'm going to say a quick prayer of getting this out and, uh, Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this conversation. Bless us, Lord, even in our doubts to greater faith. Bless our church, even in this day, to greater works, even when we can't gather. And Lord, may, um, may you continue uh, to, to be our portion. And Lord, may you continue to be who we see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. See you guys. See ya. See ya.